my, is my mic on? Mic's on. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be giving a, a sort of very short talk today about programming, libvirt, and using the vert tools. Um, probably only 15, 20 minutes long. Uh, after that, uh, however, I will be here for a Q&A. Now, this could go on for as long as we like, but um, any of these questions, if you want to think about them while I'm doing the talk, uh, and then if you can come back and ask me later. So basically, anything about virtualization with KVM on CentOS, any questions about libvirt and vert tools and so on, any questions you like about OpenStack and overt, uh, used to be called RevM, and any questions about what might happen in RHEL 7? Now, of course, I can't promise I'll be able to answer any of these questions, but you can ask away anyway. <laughs> so I have a few definitions here. And of course, what I realized after Dave's talk that uh, everybody here knows exactly what virtualization is all about. So uh, I, won't, I won't dwell on these. But you know, virtualization, running one operating system on top of or inside another. Uh, a hypervisor is that bit of code which, t which mediates access between these guests and the host. And we have some terminology. We say the host is what's ever, what everything's running on, one physical machine. Oh, I'll try and stick this on a bit firmer this time. Um, so the hypervisor mediates access between the, the host uh, and the guests that are running on there. And we have a library called libvert, which is a cross-hypervisor um, cross management library. Clouds, it's the big new thing, right? Clouds are uh, where all the, all, the, all the VC's money is going at the moment. Basically, it's, you know, what, old, what is old is new again. It's a place where you run your VMs. It's a place where someone else manages your VMs, or maybe you manage someone else's VMs. And there's uh, some terminology that may come up later. So self-service VMs, that means you go along with your credit card and you say, I want a VM for the next two hours. Versus more managed situations where you maybe have to ring someone up and they provision it for you and it might take a little bit longer. And of course, most clouds we're familiar with, like Amazon EC2, are public clouds. But people have looked at these and said, wouldn't this be great if we could run all our, v run all our VMs with an organization as if we were running them on Amazon EC2, but we don't actually want to run them on Amazon EC2. We want to have a private cloud. And finally, my final set of definitions here, disk images. These are very important to me because uh, I've authored a library called libguestfs, which is a library for managing disk images. These disk images are virtualized hard drives. And if you think about a machine, a virtual machine that's switched off, all of the state of that virtual machine is really in the disk image. So when you, when you, when you want to send someone a VM, you often want to send them really a disk image. Got a question at the back, I think? Um, so the question was, I, I should say what I do and why I'm knowledgeable about this area. So uh, I work for Red Hat, and I work on virtualization technologies uh, with libvirt, libguestfs, OpenStack stuff, overt, and so on. Um, OK, I've got on my laptop here a few locally installed guests. Th these I actually use for testing. So um, I just want to show you some of the commands. Now, I'm using the versh command here, which is a, uh, a command to list the guests that are installed. It looks like a, a really random mix. Unfortunately, no CentOS guests here. And I'm running Fedora on the laptop. <laughs> um, there we go. Uh, and another version command that you might um, may or may not like is one called dump XML, which dumps out the, I'm not going to say configuration, because I know, I know everyone loves XML. <laughs> you shouldn't, when you're using libvert, to be fair, there is a bit of XML involved, but you shouldn't have to really write, and possibly you should never even really read the XML, uh, the tools on top of libvirt should be managing all that for you. And if, if there's a situation where you actually have to get into the XML that libvirt's using, then probably you're either a programmer using libvirt, or you're, you know, you're probably the tool is failing in some way by not hiding these details from you. But I will show you just, uh, just one thing. This is, a, this is a Fedora 18 guest that I've got installed here. And down at the bottom here is the one of the disks. And, and there is that one there <coughs> is the disk image that's backing this disk. So that's a logical volume. It's a 20 gigabyte logical volume, in fact. 
So what I'm going to do today, because I don't want to disturb any of these guests for my demo, because I'm using them for testing, I'm going to create an overlay disk. And this is one of the wonderful things about virtualization. It's incredibly flexible. I've got, of course, my 20 gigabyte. Yeah, sorry about that. I forgot that this is not, in fact, a, it is. There. I've got my 20 gigabyte logical volume backing disk. And of course, I want it to be read only, because I don't want to disturb it for this talk. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a 20 gigabyte QCOW2 format overlay on top of that. And what that overlay is going to do when I run it on my KPM hypervisor, KVM hypervisor, it's going to, all the reads are going to come from the backing disk. So whenever the hypervisor wants to read anything, it's going to read it from the backing disk. But whenever something is written, it's not going to go to the backing disk. It's going to be stored in this overlay. And you see that I've drawn the overlay, it's 20 gigabytes, but it starts off quite small because at the beginning, all it is, it's just a header, it's just, it's just a, a, a little file that contains a link to the backing disk. But as the writes happen, this file is going to get a bit bigger because it's going to store the writes. And then when the hypervisor later on wants to read something that's been written, it's going to read it just back from here. And the, the end result of this is that my, my backing disk is not touched and my overlay grows with all the changes that I'm making. So this is actually running on my laptop. So uh, I'm going to use the QME image create command to create a QCOW2 format overlay file. That, um, that's the name of the overlay file. And that's the link to the backing disk. Happens immediately. So quick, some, some quick information about that. You can see the backing file. Cluster size 64K, that means that the block, if you write to even one byte within that 64K block, then that block gets copied from the backing disk and appended to the QCAD2 file. The virtual size of this, that's the, that's the size within the VM that it appears is 20 gigabytes, but the actual size of the file is much smaller than that because it's, not, it's just a header in a, a two-level tree which maps the which maps those clusters to the virtual space. So the actual size is still 196K. We can actually, I say we don't need to write in the XML, so I'm going to import this into libvirt using the vert install import command. And that actually will import it into libvirt and starts it booting, as you can see. In fact, once that's, once that's started, I, uh, I don't need the, the vert install command any, anymore, but I can reconnect using vert viewer. Let's just let that VM that I've created boot up. So again, what's going on here? I've got my backing disk, which I don't want to touch. And I've, got, I've created a new guest. As me, I'm not root. I've just created a new guest, and it's linked to that backing disk. But all the writes are going to the overlay. And now I'm booting up my overlay guest. So let's, let me just log in. I'm actually just going to log in as, as root on the console. and. Uh, and actually just power it down, because I don't, I don't need this yet for my little demo. So let's just power that off. I'll just show that it was up there. Okay. Libvirt maintains several lists of guests on the machine. So the one I showed you before was the root list. That's, that's all the root installed guests. These are the guests that I'm running as me. And there's only one. That's just the one I've just created. Um, and you, as you can see, it's actually just disappeared. That's because it's gone, it's shut itself off. So if I do all, it'll, it'll show it's been shut off. And uh, just quickly, I'll show you the, that's the XML. That was the XML that, that Vert Install created for me. I didn't have, to, didn't have to create this XML. And the overlay disk there, you see I'm not using the backing disk, I'm just talking to the overlay disk. And finally, I run that QMU image info command again. And the only thing that's changed here is the on-disk disk size, which is now 21 megabytes. And of course, that's stored all the writes that happened when the guest was booting. Backing file's not been touched at all. OK, so one thing I could do, let's see what the differences are when you boot a guest between the guest as it's in its previous state, the backing file, and the guest in its new state. This is, these, these are writes that have happened as I just booted it, logged in, type the power of command tools here. It's called VertLS. And VertLS does pretty much what it says in the box. It, it cracks open this disk image. It does a recursive LS uh, in a particular format. And then I'm sorting that and writing that out. 
takes a few seconds because obviously a recursive LS over an entire disk does take a few seconds. I'm going to run the second command. This is the second command against the overlay now. So the first command was against the backing disk. That's the, the old state. Second command against the overlay. That's the, that's the new state. And again, it takes a few seconds because it's doing a recursive LS over the, over the uh, new disk. And finally, what I'm going to do when this just finishes, I'm going to diff the two files. There we go. Let's just have a look at the differences between the old state and the new state just after I booted it. So it should be fairly, um, fairly obvious here. So the etcresolve.com file has changed. I suspect that's because it probably didn't have network access. So I suspect it, uh, DHCP came up, couldn't find network, wrote something to etcresolve.conf. Uh, bash history has grown by 10 bytes. Is that expected? I, I logged in and I typed the power off command, which is only eight characters. So does it store a CRLF? <laughs> Who knows? And uh, th there's some evidence here that Network Manager started up. For some reason there, it's, it deleted those temporary RPM DB files. I have no idea what that is. Uh, and some log files have changed and grown. It, it's kind of, you know, it's what you'd expect from just booting and then shutting down a guest. So let's go further. Let's actually clone my backing disk. And obviously, to, to clone a backing disk, virtual machines are incredibly flexible. You can just take the disk image, you can just copy it, and you've got a clone. Brilliant, right? But the problem with that is that you, some things about the copy are identical to the original, and you probably don't want that to be the case. Now, now one of these things, would, for example, would be the SSH host keys. You don't really want the SSH host keys to be identical to the original because it, it means from SSH's point of view, when you SSH in, there's no difference. You can't tell the difference between the original and the new guest. And you probably want to give it a new host name. You probably want to change the UUIDs on the file system. Why might you want to do that? Because if you try to mount it on the host and, the, and two file systems from two different guests have the same UUID, the host will get really confused. Um, another thing, important thing you want to do for security is to give the guest a different random seed file. Virtual machines have a lot of problem getting enough randomness into them because they, 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 they never talk to the outside world. They only talk to the hypervisor using sort of virtualized networks and stuff. So, so they're not, they can't get a good source of randomness, which means when you clone a guest, you don't, you, don't want to, you don't want to be a situation where you've cloned a guest a hundred times and they all have the same random seed and then they all start up and they all have predictable TCP sequence numbers or something like that. You want to give them all randomness as you clone them. So the tool I'm using here is called uh, Vert Sysprep. Sysprepping is a, a Windows-ism, but it means, to, uh, it means to prepare the system for, uh, after you've cloned it for a new, uh, a new instance of the system. And Vertsys prep is pretty powerful. It can do lots and lots of different things to your, to your guests. Um, final thing I might want to do. So I've, so I've Vertsys prepped my, the, the copied VM that I just did, just there. Final thing I'm going to do, and I wrote this program especially for this talk, is to set the root password to something. So I say I wrote this program in Perl today, uh, a few days ago for setting root passwords for VMs. Let's have a quick look at it. It's very simple. I'm afraid, I'm sorry about the default colors that, oh, they don't look too bad there, do they? On my laptop screen, the yellow is almost unreadable. So we have bindings for libvert and libguestfs and the other tools for, for dozens of programming languages. So really, it's whatever language you're familiar with or you're happy with. I'm using <coughs> Perl here, but you could use you know, Python and Ruby and a camel and whatever you want, Java and all that. Um, and I'm using here two libraries. Well, I was originally using the libvert bindings, but it turned out once I'd written the program, I, I wasn't actually using the libvert bindings. They're used implicitly by libguestfs, but I never use them explicitly. And I'm using the libguestfs Perl bindings. That's the name of the VM. That's my super secret new password that I want to give it. And this code here is how you create a password for ETC Shadow, which I didn't know before, but I found out. And so we, that's the, that's the whole program there. It's only about 30 lines long. 
We crack open the VM. I'm not, don't need to run any of this as, as root. We crack open the disk image. Uh, we mount the root disk from the disk image. Don't need to be root to any of this. We download the old etc shadow file. We update root's password, and then we write it back. And then finally, at the end, we uh, tell, give it an SE Linux auto relabel, which is kind of the safe thing to do. You just, you just tell it to auto relabel the whole disk. And even though I only want to auto relabel etc shadow, this is kind of easy, easier. So let's just run that. When you, when you create a new file on a real live running SE Linux system, SE Linux jumps in and relabels that file for you. It gives it the correct label for a file in that location. But if, you, uh, if SE Linux is not running, you can't get the correct label for the file because you kind of need to read all the SE Linux databases to get that. Now, the, the workaround for this is that you boot the VM or boot the machine and you've, and you've touched slash dot auto relabel in the root directory. And then what happens, SE Linux sees that and it says, all right, I'll just auto relabel the whole file system now. Which is obviously slow and a bit stupid, but it does the job, right? Do you need the auto relabel because of your sysprep changes or from the shadow? Uh, sysprep will automatically set the auto relabel file well, for you. you. If you just change the file, why would you then need to recreate it? Uh, for which one, for sysprep? Um, I think you just well, changed the file. Well, actually, right? I, in this case, I probably overwrote it, so I probably need to set the label. I d I'm not sure on that. Right. Maybe you don't need it, but it's safe. All right. If you're not using SE Linux, you don't need it either. So. Oh. Sorry, it's fair enough. Oh. Um, oops. Sorry. So let's... Uh, I missed out the last step here. So let's finally start up this VM. And look at it. I'm really hoping that when it boots up, it will both auto relabel and it will also have a new root password. I only tested this once, so uh, the other problem here is that my my presentation software and Vert Viewer fight each other for the view of the for, to be on top. Could I ask a very dumb question here? Sure. Your virtualization viewer. Um, yep. Is this are we talking? Is this part of the uh, the Zen, or is this part of OpenStack, or is this something else? Uh, Vert type? Viewer is is a fairly low level tool, which is part of well, it's part of the kind of libvert Vert tools family. So it it will work with many different libvert. I mean, if if your guests are managed by libvert, you can probably use Vert Viewer. Is the is the news there? All right. So in fact, it did the relabel, and it's now rebooting again because it it reboots when it once it's relabeled itself. So hopefully I'll be able to log in when it finally reboots. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. I, need, I really need to change the, um, so I wrote this presentation software myself. So I really ha only have myself to blame <laughs> if it doesn't work. Um, so let's log in. OK, here we go. Let's log in, and hopefully 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 will work. Ta da Yes, there we go. And you can see that you can see it's got a new host name. And behind the scenes, it will also have things like a new random seed and all that stuff. So all right, I don't need that anymore, so let's turn that off. So that, that's really the end of my demo. But I will do, we'll just quickly talk about a few things that you can do with libvert and some of these <laughs> Okay. Some things you do with libvert. Well, it's a cross hypervisor C library for controlling VMs. So if you need to write software or write scripts that control VMs, start them up, shut them down, migrate them, you should probably be using libvert. It also works with containers. Uh, it's it, is, it allows remote management, which means that you can access it remotely over the network, and that's all secured. It can either use an SSH transport or it can use its own TLS-based transport. It can do lots of things, including, as well as just what we call lifecycle management, which is a fancy way of starting and stopping VMs. It can also do storage and network management of your remote machine. It supports snapshots. Uh, so all those QMU image commands that I was typing in there, you could actually use through libvert if you wanted. 
It has a way of storing secrets. Uh, these are passwords and things that are required to decrypt disks and things like that. It has a secure mechanism for storing those. It can also do SANS, it can do iSCSI, it can connect your guests through Ceph or Gluster, and it has multiple language bindings. Uh, and there's a very rich environment around Libvirt now. And it's been in development for about seven years, so it's, it's pretty mature software. Some things you can do with LibGuestFS, well, we've seen the first few things here. You can do differences, sysprepping, adding and creating, uh, add, adding and changing passwords. Security auditing, this might be interesting. We are now using a tool called OpenScap. Um, it probably this will appear in RHEL 7. Uh, OpenScap allows you to publish vulnerability information for your operating system. And we can process that information. You can give us a, a disk image that you don't really know anything about, and you can examine, and you can examine it with a tool called OSScan um, to scan for, say, CVEs that the disk might be, that the guest might be vulnerable to, um, or configuration problems such as writable directories which shouldn't be writable, or password files that have the wrong uh, permissions. And, and this happens, you can do this before you boot the disk up, which is quite important, of course, if you're running a public cloud, because you want to, you want to have some assurance that, uh, that the disk images that people just come along and, and give you aren't going to cause trouble down the road. Resizing, cloning and templates, uh, sparsification, this is where you, take, where you take disk images and you actually recover uh, unused disk space from them on, back to your host, so you make them thinner. Uh, lots of stuff in libvirt about monitoring, lots of stuff in libguestfs for monitoring. Uh, OpenStack uses libguestfs for injecting files and editing files. You can take a disk image that you know nothing about and you can inspect it so you can find out what file systems it contains or what operating system it contains. Um, we have tools for editing the Windows registry, we have tools for editing Linux configuration files, and again, we have multiple language bindings. Some things you can do with OpenStack, well, OpenStack is pretty much equivalent nowadays to Amazon EC2 in terms of functionality. Uh, you can obviously create public clouds with OpenStack, but you can also use it to create your own private clouds. Um, OpenStack is all about self-service, that means coming along it, it doesn't actually have a charging component, which is, which is the, the one missing piece, because you're, you're supposed to link it to your own charging system. But you can come along with a credit card, or if it's an internal pub, uh, private cloud, you can come along with some sort of internal billing or auditing system. Get a VM, get a VM as, as you saw from Dave's demo, you can get a VM very, very quickly, uh, provisioned very quickly. Uh, in RHEL 7, we'll be able to import from ESX and physical machines into OpenStack, and OpenStack is heavily um, backed by Red Hat now. So we have 20 plus developers working full time on OpenStack. Um, we are either the top contributor or within the top three at the moment. Some things you can do with Overt. Overt, um, we open sourced this a couple of years ago. It used to be called RevM. It used to be called Cumra, CumraNet or something. Um, it used to be called RevM. The upstream project is now called Overt. This is about centralized management. It's, it's more similar to vSphere or um, Virtual Center, or those, sort of, those sort of tools. Uh, it can do lots and lots of <laughs> clever stuff, but its main focus is about virtual desktops. And in RHEL 6, or in fact in CentOS 6, you can uh, import from ESX directly into Overt, and you can import from physical machines, convert them into virtual machines running on Overt. And that is the end of my main talk. So on the left-hand side there, some links. You can find up some more stuff about what I've been talking about. Presentation software is called Tech Talk. Do have a look at it if you want. And on the right-hand side, a suggested list of questions if people do want to do a Q&A about this. OK, take the first question. <coughs> Just look at your overlay stuff that you had mentioned earlier on. Is that a one-to-one -one relationship between the base and the overlay, or can you have one base and then loads of different overlays for different machines? So the question was, is there a one-to-one -one relationship between the backing file and the overlay? The answer is you can have as many um, overlays as you want on a backing file. You can also stack them up in a tree, uh, tree arrangement if you want. Now one thing I will caution you, however, um, because, the, because the backing file you might think, well, I'll, I'll take the backing file, and while the overlay is running, I'll boot the backing file up. But you, if you do that, what will happen is you'll get massive disk corruption. And the reason for that is 
possibly not clear, but it's, it's because if the, if, the, if the VM that's connected to the backing file writes to some part of the backing file, then the overlay, if it's not overlaying that particular cluster, will actually read from the, from the updated data. And, and it'll, just not, it'll just not do the right thing at all. So if you, want to, if you want to have multiple VMs booting from a template or backing file, that's fine. But make sure e each of them has their own overlay underneath. I mean, some of the technologies you've got there for VDI you mentioned, is any of that using the overlay technology just to say? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Overt uh, and OpenStack are both using QCOW2 overlays extensively. So um, in Overt, there's actually a whole thing where you can create templates and sysprep them, and, and, and then you can create VMs very quickly, of course, from those because it, it's much quicker to create a VM from an overlay than it is to create a VM by, by booting up and installing and going through the whole install process and downloading RPMs and installing them. I'm guessing if you put something like put your base file on say like a RAM disk or something like that, you could probably have really, really quick provisioning in terms of Absolutely, like yeah. multiple guests reading off of it. And Absolutely, yes. You can, you, it's a really, really quick way to provision um, provision guests. But you have to be aware of the, the limitations around it. Cloning may not be the best way to create to provision your VMs. I mean, if you talk to the puppet guys, they will tell you that you absolutely must have recipes that you that you so you can create your you can recreate your VMs from a from a recipe from scratch. Um, and that is, you know, that's great if you have the discipline to do that. And and I can tell you from experience that I don't have the discipline to do that. <laughs> Okay, let's take some from the back. Uh, I think I saw you These overlay files, um, are they any different to what you could achieve with using normal snapshotting? Well, it, it is. Sorry, the question is, is this different from snapshotting? And the answer is, with QMU, the situation is slightly complex because QMU has... has uh, a system for snapshotting, which is sort of separate from the system for backing files and overlays. But uh, at the end of the day, there are, there are several ways to do this, but they all kind of are the same thing. They're different aspects of the same thing. I'm thinking more along the lines of LVM type snapshot, where you pass the you're on a VM off of a raw block device. Right. So yes, um, I mean this is a fairly new feature. LVM can now actually do. Well, actually, LVM snapshots are not a new feature, but LVM thin provisioned um, block devices with thin provisioned snapshots are a new feature, and that, and that and that that's sort of the equivalent in LVM land to what we're doing with files. But again, it's all different aspects of the same thing. Um, Libgestvest and Libvert will will use any of these technologies that you want. There's no difference as far as we're concerned. Your question? Yep. Uh, one on storage and one on um, uh, security. So on the storage side of things, if you've got a copy and write file system underlying it, such as ButterFS, can it make use of that for far more efficient um, uh, copies without the uh, cons of um, backing files and things like that? So the question is, does, does ButterFS, which of course can do um, copy on write natively, um, does that change anything? The answer is that we, I mean, at this level, I'm giving you a bucket of bits, and you can use ButterFS or whatever, and LibGuestFS or LibVert will use those. But LibVert does, I think, have a ButterFS uh, driver as well, so it can. So all the storage management that LibVert can do can happen on ButterFS. Uh, basically, we're giving you a bucket of bits to do what you want, and the fact that you're using ButterFS or LVM or LV snapshots or QK2 overlays doesn't make a blind bit of difference to us. Fair enough. And the on the security side, so Libver um, and on the VNC based front end, um, they currently support GSAPI for um, Kerberos authentication and encryption. Uh, yeah, I believe they do. Yes. Yep. Is there are you aware of any work going on on the QXL side of things to uh, to provide that similar support? I, uh, that's a it's a good question, and I'm afraid I do not have any idea what the answer is. I'm sorry. Fair enough. <laughs> Cheers. Hiya. Um, what uh, disk image formats does uh, libguestfs support? So you mentioned QCOW. Um, you, you name it, we support it. So VMDK, um, the, what's it called? VHD, which is the one Hyper-V uses. Uh, v, is it VDI, the virtual box one? Mm. Um, obviously QCOW 2, obviously RAW. <coughs> I mean, you name it, yeah, we'll do it. Cool. And the reason we can do that is because we're using 
We're just using QME block drivers. And we also have a, a separate project called MBD Kit, which is, so MBD, network block device, uh, lets you talk to block devices over the network. It's, it's quite a flexible and simple protocol. And we have a, a server which you can use, and it's a highly pluggable, very, very liberally licensed server. So you can link it with horrible proprietary code, which means that you can access proprietary SAN APIs or proprietary things like VDDK, which is VMware's disk library. And then you just expose everything over MBD, and then LibGuestFS and indeed QMU just talk straight to MBD and doesn't care about the disk format underneath. So we, we're basically, if there's a disk image, we are absolutely able to read it, whatever it is. And of course, the, all the file systems inside there, so if, there's, you know, if it's got ButterFS and it's got a, a NetBSD partitioning scheme or something, that's fine, we'll just, we can deal with all that, everything. Uh, now that you mentioned uh, N N D B, um, sorry N B D, what is there any particular reason for the preference of N B D over something like iSCSI or A T A over Ethernet? Well, we, yeah, we, I mean, we can do iSCSI things? as well. It's just that N B D uh, is such a simple protocol; it's very, as it were, accessible. So, lots of things can talk it. Uh, we have N B D Kit, which can convert just about anything into an N B D server. But there's no, I mean, iSCSI, you know, fine. Yeah, we'll, we can access iSCSI directly as well, as a client. <coughs> Any more questions? Okay. So you talked about going from uh, virtual, uh, physical to virtual. Can you go back the other way? No. We can only go from, so we have a tool called Vert V2V, which is written by my colleague, Matt Booth. <laughs> Um, now, Vert V2V can do physical to virtual and virtual to virtual in some limited scenario. So, for example, it can convert from ESX, from the old RHEL 5 Zen, uh, not from Citrix Zen. And it, and it mainly goes, at the moment, it goes to KVM or to Overt, and it will be able to do two OpenStack soon. But we're also going to try and make it go both in all directions soon. Um, and it can do physical to virtual as well. So you can take a physical machine, you boot it with either Pixie or a, C a CD image, and it runs a little program there that then converts all the disks through to V2V, turns them into virtual machines. Um, it's used by lots of big companies at the moment. I can't tell you their names, but trust me. <laughs> Red Hat consultants use it quite a lot. Um, it, it does not, however, do virtual to physical at all. And we have actually no intention of doing that. Anyone else have any questions? No one wants to ask I'm me not, proprietary I'm not sure I'm, about I'm in <laughs> scope. But it's about the KVM architecture and the uh, stub domain compared to Xen. So I'm not sure if it's out of scope. I, you, you would totally need to ask a Xen. Well, on the KVM side, I mean, do you have some visibility on this aspect? I, I do not know. I mean, I, not as far as I'm aware, no. So. Uh, What's happening in Red Hat 7 that's exciting? <laughs> <laughs> um, everyone will have to use GNOME 3 and System D all the time. No, I'm joking. Am I? <laughs> well, I uh, say, so, so we've got, we've got uh, in virtualization land, we've got tons of chism. has been a massive amount of development in Vert, in the management tools, in OpenStack, in Overt, and that's all happened, you know, since RHEL 6 was released, which was like 2011 or something. Um, no, 2010 even. So there's probably been three, two or three years of, of solid development work. And it, so, so tons and tons of new features. And, and it, it, from my point of view, of course, I'm using Fedora, so I'm just using all these new features all the time. It's quite hard to, to uh, you know, to really see how some of these things are actually quite cool and new, but um, let me think. I mean, it, it's just, there's, there's so much stuff has changed since then. I mean, do you have a particular feature you're waiting for, or? Uh? No, no, I just thought you were uh, <laughs> wanting to get to that again. <laughs> no, I, I, I thought people would, ask, would want to ask me about system D or something. It's the end of the ride for 5.x, you know, you're not, you're not going to keep 5, 6, and 7 going in. Um, for we're going to we're, we're supporting even back to rel three as guests on 
that's for some customers who pay us a ton of money to support Rail 3, <laughs> can you believe, on, on um, because they, they, you know, they want to virtualize their, they have Rel 3 and it's on some hardware that's failing or something and they actually want to virtualize that because they want to keep it going. So, so yep. what about Xen on Rel 7? Uh, as a client, definitely. Yeah, zero, of course. Um, depends how the changes go upstream, but they, they, won't, it, they won't be in the uh, Red Hat kernel. <coughs> but been, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that CentOS has their own CentOS has their own extended version kernel, which, which will almost certainly carry that stuff. Got a question at the back. Um, do we know which kernel we're going to get with oh. RHEL 7 yet? Please. <laughs> um, I do not know. I could actually find out if you really wanted to know, but I don't know off the top of my head. It'd just be interesting, because obviously there's some great new stuff happening, and uh, yeah. it's been a while since we had a new kernel to play with. Absolutely, yeah. OK, are there any more questions? Well, I think that's. I have a oh yeah, um, I, I don't know if any work is being done for live migration between major versions. Is that something which, because a lot of people running Sand five suddenly found themselves in a place they couldn't move their VMs to six because there was no Sand, and that was actually one of the primary drivers behind doing the work to get Zen going on Sand six. So, uh, we have Vert V to V, which will convert offline because we won't do a live migration, but it will convert offline from uh, Rel five Zen to KVM. If that's right. what people want to do, of course, it may not be what people want to do. Um, but rel 6 to rel 7 I'm, I'm not sure if live migration will work, although I'm fairly sure it should do. I'm not sure what the answer to that is, actually. Wait and watch then. Yeah. Um, I can find out, actually. That'd be interesting, because lots of people would be interested in doing that. Hmm. I mean, so there'll be live migration from KVM rel 6 to KVM rel 7 obviously. Right. Or, K or from KVM CentOS 6 to KVM CentOS I don't CentOS think that actually works with um, 5 to 6 at the moment, even with KVM. I think there's, uh, okay. I, I think libword stuff has changed enough that it doesn't like, the libword on 5 doesn't like the libword in 6 very much. Hmm. That's so not supposed, I mean, that's absolutely not supposed to happen, because libword's supposed to be totally backwards compatible back to the original base. So, no. I mean, I'm sorry that didn't work out, but... If there is a bug for that, we, we should fix that because that, I mean, it really is supposed to happen. I know there is a bug for it on bugs.centos.org. I'll make sure I get it across okay. to you yeah, and do that. assign it to you. <laughs> I'll, I'll assign I'll it to um, it. I'll assign it to liver, guys. That's fine, yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, thanks, thanks, Richard. Thanks for coming along. Okay.